Hello, Dan Days, and welcome back to this is the episodes that I do. Uh, I'm still calling the show that, and I think I'm going to keep it that way. Today, we have parenthesis I back on the show. Uh, we're going to continue our conversation about utopian anarchism and uh, some of the finer details that parenthesis I has developed uh, since that time. So up on the screen, I have pulled up here, uh, you know, your blog, and you wrote two entries recently. One is Imagining Utopian Anarchist Communities, and the other one is Envisioning a Utopian Anarchism. And uh, I wanted to go through these because I really like the way you lay it out. You know, you have very pointed, well-sectioned bits uh, that cover your vision. And um, I thought that using the envisioning a utopian anarchism one might give a little more coverage of uh, of some of the important topics than the other other one did. But before we get to that one, so in imagining utopian anarchist communities, you uh, you elaborate on ten principles, right? Uh, and if you're able to, you want to go through those 10 principles real quick uh, yeah. and uh, why they're important? Yeah. Yeah. So I remember the last time I was on your podcast here, like I said, I wanted to write something about my kind of utopian anarchism. And since the last podcast, I've here I am. <laughs> I've written that stuff. <laughs> and so these two blog entries. Yeah. And so like uh, with my kind of utopian anarchism, it's based on like 10 principles. And so I'll go through them here kind of briefly. Uh, principle number one is like keep an image in mind of the kind of society you want. Like in other words, focus on what is it, what it is that you do want, the kind of world that you want, the kind of society or relationships you want, as opposed to like focusing on all the things you don't want, which is what most of the time anarchists and radicals tend to do is like, mm -hmm. you know, anti this, anti that, you know, or this sucks, that sucks, you know, it's always like, all the things you don't want, but here I think there's a real power of like being really clear on what it is you want and focus on it, and then from there try to find ways to to go in that direction. Let me pause you on. Sorry, let me pause you on that one real quick because one of the things uh, I've been hearing more and more over the years is uh, the the slogan or the phrase that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism which I think was popularized by this guy, Mark Fisher. My, oh, Mark I, Fisher? What was his name? Oh, Something okay. Fisher. I thought it was Ursula Le Guin. Because uh, like, wasn't it like the follow-up part? Like saying like there was a time like people, was it the divine right of kings, you know, was unquestioned. And now like people don't even think of it anymore. Um, She did say that. Yeah, the guy's name is Mark Fisher. But uh, he wrote a book called Capitalist Realism. Uh -huh. that popularized it. I don't think it was initially his phrase, but I might be wrong about that. So this seems to find the face of that notion that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Uh, since you're saying, let's keep a vision in mind. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it flies in the face of it. I'd say it goes right along with it in the sense that it is easier to imagine it in the world. <laughs> like, um, you know, people thinking about it all the time, about all the horrible things that we live in and that we're going to live in. But like, so it takes some like real effort to like keep on going back to like reminding yourself, no, 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 what I do want is X, Y, and Z. True, true. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for all those Mark Fisher fans out there watching and listening, uh, number one, that's a good one. All right. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Well, yeah. Number two, uh, try to have a comprehensive understanding of the various systems at play. So kind of based on number one, like, you know, the kind of world you want, then kind of breaking it down to like, okay, you want these things. How do those things work? You know, break down the components and what's going on and how they affect each other. Trying to have more of a comprehensive understanding as opposed to just having a vague thing of, I want everybody to get along. Instead of right. that, you go into like everybody getting along with that looks like is this kind of thing, and it's this is how people are getting along. This is what's taking place behind the scenes that makes getting along possible. 
let's see, number three, uh, keep in mind the goal of it all is what I call quadruple H, <laughs> as opposed to 4-H, which I guess is trademarked. <laughs> quadruple yeah. H is uh, happy, healthy, harmonious humans. Uh, yeah. That, yeah, and that's what I say, like anarchism, like why, why be an anarchist? Why have anarchism? It's like, well, in the end, what I want is happy, healthy, harmonious humans. <laughs> you know, you want people to be, enjoy life and, you know, be healthy and all that kind of stuff. You can put it on a motivational poster. Yeah, a motivational <laughs> poster with a circle A and all that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, why not? Uh, number four, uh, keep in mind the mission of anarchism here is to eliminate all forms of domination and to replace it with voluntary cooperation. That's almost like the mission statement kind of thing of like what anarchism is for. Pretty important. In the positive sense, yeah. Uh, number five, uh, keep in mind the four interconnected perspectives. Uh, and this is also a numbered list. I, I imagine you'd be asking me about later. Yes. Uh, of like the individual, the relational, the structural, and the physical. And uh, yeah, and... So I kind of view like human life, it's kind of comprised of these things. We have our individual existence that everybody personally has and, you know, your, your habits, what you do, what you think and what you feel individually. There's the relationships of how people one-on-one -on -one and small groups, how people relate to each other, what they do with each other directly, how they talk to each other. Uh, there's the structural, like the kind of larger groups and groups of groups that we have and institutions that we have. And then there's the physical, like the the physical buildings that we live within and the food that we eat and all that kind of stuff, our environment, you know, the, the soil and the air and the water and all that good stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah, so keeping in mind all these things about like, and how we're treating them and the actions and choices that we're making in relation to all these things. Yeah. And yeah, so we'll definitely go on that more uh, in a bit. Yeah. So uh, number six uh, critiques are valued, but they're not the main focus. Yeah, that's kind of like restating in a way, like, number one, you know, keep in mind the image that you want. But that's going into, like, anarchists spend a lot of time and effort on critiques. And sometimes yeah. they can, <laughs> like, really you know, go into, like, denunciations, you know, in the most extreme form, right? But you, it's... Uh, you know what I... Oh, sorry. Oh, you yeah. Know what go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I've noticed, too, is um, not only is there a focus on critique, but it seems like when there is a critique that means something should be rejected you know yeah. and like i critique things all the time and keep doing them yeah. <laughs> like it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean you that the thing has to be totally gotten rid of or whatever what and yeah and i think like if you take that kind of stance that everything that has a critique needs to be abandoned you won't have anything left <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because because there's like you know the the horrors of domination society, you know, it affects everything, you know, it, it taints everything in a way. So there is no real purity. <laughs> so, right. like, yeah, I value it in, in, in term, critique in the sense of to understand, you know, the potential problems and dangers and setbacks and drawbacks and limitations. But like in the end, what we're going for is like the beautiful ideal, you know, the vision that's drawing us, not the, the things that we hate. Yeah. Yep. And so number seven, heartfelt conversations, uh, holding both the needs of yourself and others is the basis of it all. And so this, this kind of uh, most directly points to uh, my background and appreciation for nonviolent communication. You know, that if you have like people being really honest, authentic with each other, really trying to have empathy with each other and trying to have as much care for each other as possible and have conversations based on that 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 forms the basis of connection and trust. And I think I remember you saying to me once too, like about like how trust is like the bottom line kind of social currency or something that- Yeah, I said possible. trust is the, is the currency of social life. Yeah, there you go, yeah. And so I think, you know, having these heartfelt conversations is kind of can build trust over time. Oh yeah. And let's see, number eight, all social constructs are impermanent and can be replaced with new ones if necessary. And so I kind of view uh, that as, for me, that draws back to Max Stirner <laughs> and like how he, you know, uh, his idea of spooks. And I, instead of using the word spooks or geist and all that, I use a phrase, yeah, social construct, you know. And yeah. social constructs are all over the place, you know, that we create. 
And doesn't, if we recognize doesn't sound that, as silly. Yeah, yeah. You're not talking about ghosts. <laughs> You're just talking about stuff socially that we create together. But we can also get rid of if we want to. And to every every concept that we create together, to always keep in mind, we can get rid of it and relate differently, have a different kind of social construct. And let's see. Uh, number nine, uniformity is not necessary for sufficient cooperation to be possible. So, you know, I have all kinds of ideas and I've written a bunch of things and I would love people for, to love appreci and appreciate everything I say and think, right? That would be wonderful. But I realize doing that, would it's not necessary. And it's also detrimental. And the same goes for anybody else, any other thinker. Like, you know, we can appreciate any thinker out there, but uniformity, it's not necessary. <laughs> so like any kind of ism or any kind of ideology, like I, I don't, I, I think we don't, and nobody needs to sign up for anything. <laughs> that the key thing is like to authentically bring like yourself, your, your actual thoughts and feelings and beliefs and such, and like dialogue and by negotiating and working through things, then we can like, that's the kind of basis for relationship I want, not so, people signing on to an ideology. When you say that, you mean uniformity uh, in the like having a, uh, like a shared ideology, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But and, what about uh, when it comes to like consensus? Do you believe more in a modified consensus, or uh, you know, when you're making decisions, like a uh, consensus minus one, or consensus minus five, or some, you know, whatever the size of the group is, or are you not so much talking about that? Uh, yeah, not so much talking about that. Uh, I think more like like you don't have to do a purity test or an ideology test for people to work together on a project. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's weird. I think a lot of times people assume that there needs to be like a purity test or like everybody to sign on, but like there's never, it's never explicitly stated. People never consciously examine that assumption that, <laughs> that's out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Talk about, uh, yeah. Talk about, Talking about that just reminds me again of the feedback I got from the last interview I did. Yeah, yeah, and, and, that's interesting. and that happens like all the time. Yeah, like these kind of assumptions that like you're violating an essential part of purity, but it's never spelled out. Like, well, what are the expectations around purity that you're supposed to follow? What are the standards? You know, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's kind of like undefined murky ground. But if you like cross a line that's never explicitly stated, then you're a bad person forever. <laughs> yeah yeah and that's like not yeah i want to like kind of have different ways of relating you know to be used instead of that right based yeah. on heartfelt conversations like i doubt that you had any heartfelt conversations with people based on those feedback <laughs> i tried i tried yeah. some uh sometimes the failure was on my end sometimes not <laughs> and um, the last point of these 10 principles here is that all associations are voluntary Individuals can choose to leave groups and groups can choose to kick people out. Yeah, and, that's. And, yeah. So uh, I'm going to close that window and focus on uh, your other entry, envisioning a utopian anarchism. And there's a really good Buckminster Fuller quote you got in there. And if you don't have it pulled up, I could go ahead and read it. I'm just searching for it real quick. Uh, I thought it summed things up really yeah here it is oh, good so do you have it pulled up or do you want me to go ahead oh yeah you go ahead so it says uh you never change things by fighting against the existing reality to change something build a new model that makes the old model obsolete and why i like that so much is because you know there's such a emphasis on uh what anarchists call um, prefiguration. And for me, that doesn't go far enough. I don't want to just prefigure what I want. I want to immediately create the thing that I want. And uh, mm -hmm. then other people can decide if they like that more or not. But um, yeah, what, do you, what about you with that quote? It, I, it has strategic implications is what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. And uh yeah, I definitely, well, I love that quote. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, like, there's another quote that I came across. Oh, I wish I had it more immediately accessible here. 
but yeah, I'll have to find some other thing. But yeah, no, it, it, it's a different kind of orientation to like social change. You could to use that phrase, right? Like, uh, like you're not you're not fighting against the system. You're not like protesting or like whatever this is like against against against. But it's more like a different thing. Like I have an idea of what I want, and I'm going to find other people that are interested in pursuing this, and together we're like create it. Right. Yeah. So it's almost like sidestepping to the extent that you can the existing authorities. I also think what goes along with it, and it's what is uh, really important too, that you do yourself in these essays is promoting or talking about and showing things other people are doing that you would like to see more of. And that that's valuable. Like, let me give an example. I don't see anarchists talk a lot about the cooperative movement in the United States uh, or in or in England or anywhere else. Yet there is a cooperative movement or, you know, there's like some like really cool things with uh, this group that used to be called Plan. Um, I forget what they're called, but it's like uh, um, open source hardware group that has like this thing called the civilization starter kit and they've made all these machines that do like the fundamental things of civilization uh building so uh, they used to be called factor e-farm and i'm gonna pull this up real quick uh they're called open source ecology now uh or they're just called open source ecology and yeah they uh they have something called the Global Village Construction Set, which is a set of 50 different industrial machines that you can make on your own. And they give you the instructions for how to do it and everything. But just promoting things like that and showing people that there is already things happening in the world that are valuable to anarchists, even if they're not anarchists doing it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, there are other similar things, too, that you reminded me of, like, a group called Startup Societies, you know, has a similar <laughs> idea. And then Kevin Carson wrote a book too, what, The Homebrew Industrial Revolution. <laughs> right. Has some similar ideas. And then Maker Spaces too. Is exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or in, in uh, finance with like, or like, you know, being able to raise funds as a group together. There's like a Lumio or different things mm -hmm. like that. And... Uh, yeah, I just think there's a bigger world of options out there than a lot of people realize, and it could be really stifling to to not uh, bring those up as often as one can. Yeah, the, the whole like bigger world of options. Like I, I come across yeah that kind of frustration again and again because I would say so many of the people that have influenced my anarchist thinking do not call themselves anarchist. <laughs> like one of which is like Buckminster Fuller, who you mentioned already. Yeah, and. I think there's so much that like anarchist and anarchism can draw from, like from people that don't use that word. Yeah. And anarchist news just had one of their topics of the week, or they did a poll actually of your favorite non anarchist or something like that. Yeah. Um, anyway, let's get into your, uh, this piece here. You start off saying, talking about um, how you, will come up with new labels and try to create new schools of thought every few years or so. And uh, you talk about a lot of what we talked about in our last episode. Um, and then you get into your four perspectives, which you briefly went over uh, a few minutes ago, but uh, I think we could go deeper into it now. Yeah. It's kind of similar. Like the, uh, it was in like the 10 principles I mentioned, the four perspectives and, it kind of reminds me of like how in Buddhism, the four noble truths references the the noble eightfold path and vice versa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. The connection. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So the four perspectives. So like the first, and I also realized too, that like out of all the four perspectives, there's an anarchist school of thought that focuses primarily on each one too. <laughs> uh, I thought, and, yeah. Yeah. And so like what I'd like to do is like to acknowledge and incorporate all the different perspectives, not just be focused on just one of them. So, like, for example, the, the individual 
for personal perspective, and like obviously individualist anarchism and egoism focus m- mainly on that perspective. And then mm-hmm. the relational perspective, interpersonal, you know, like uh, there's something called, yeah, relational anarchism or relationship anarchy that focuses mainly on that. And then the structural perspective, like, well, that would be a lot of uh, like anarcho-communism, you know, and thinking of these big systems like that. And then uh, the physical perspective, I'd say like ecologically oriented anarchism focuses mainly on the physical. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, that was, I think that's really clever and it shows, uh, you know, that these different schools of thought are compatible if you look at them the right way. Yeah, yeah. They're compatible and like each one is essential too. Like uh, I don't want to overlook any of them and they all like affect each other too. Like how a person is individually or personally that affects relationships and you know, how relationships are affects like how a group and institution works and like how the physical environment, you know, that affects people personally and what people are capable of doing in relationship with each other. So it's all interconnected too. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Holistic. Yeah. Holistic. Like a holistic interconnected perspective. I think that kind of orientation is all over my uh, approach to utopian anarchism. Yes. Um, so let's talk about Manfred Max Neef, uh, cause that's where you begin when you start talking about how these perspectives have influenced your anarchism. Yeah. So Manfred Max Neef, he was a Chilean economist that passed away a few years ago and, uh, he had this idea, what he called like fundamental human needs or universal human needs that is that basically that everything that people do is to meet some basic need, uh, whether it be like your physical needs, you know, like air and water, food, or like uh, emotional needs or social needs, like, you know, belonging and connection or uh, mental needs like understanding or expression, you know, all kinds of different things like that. And all these needs can be met in like potentially infinite different ways. And so like what he makes the distinction between a need and a satisfier or a strategy you know, okay. different things that you can do to meet the need, which is distinct from, like, the need itself. And so that opens up, like, infinite options of ways that people can meet needs and to not get stuck on, like, meeting needs in a particular way. And you compare this with the concept standard of living uh, or gross, gross national product, and I think that's really interesting because I usually work off of, like, uh I try to figure out what a standard of living should be first. And you you seem to be challenging that here. Yeah. Well, like, uh, because, uh, yeah, standard, it assumes like a, a certain kind of myste- a material standard of how much money or wealth and stuff you have. And uh, what, Man- Man- what Manfred Max Neef said is that you don't really need any particular standard as well as people's, as long as people's needs are being met, as long as people are, well, as I said earlier, healthy, happy, harmonious humans, <laughs> you know, right. as long as that's going on. Yeah. You don't have to have lots of money and stuff if your needs are being met. Uh, so, yeah. So if you want to learn more about that, definitely Manfred Max Neef is where to go looking. Um, your second one is the comprehensive anticipatory design science. Oh, yeah. And that's the Buckminster Fuller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so his whole thing, yeah, was like from like a systems perspective and an engineering perspective. How can you, like as the name says, have a comprehensive worldview and anticipatory, like you anticipate potential problems and shortfalls. And actually, that's like one area where like critique can be useful too. You know, if you like incorporate all the key learnings from like critiques, you can use that to anticipate potential problems and shortfall uh, when you design a new system. And design, well, that's the key thing. Yes, like you intentionally design something to implement instead of like haphazardly walk into it. Uh, And science, of course, we all love science here. Well, as long as we're not anti-civ, I guess. (laughs) But yeah, you know, try to systematize, you know, try to have stuff based on observable fact as much as you can, yeah. Um, number three is utopian socialism, which, uh, yeah, go on. Yeah. Oh yeah. So you're looking yeah, here at the, my f- four influences of my kind of utopian anarchism. Yeah. And so, yeah. So 
where I'm coming from, yeah, these, uh, what you mentioned already with Manfred Max Nietzsche, Human Needs, Comprehensive Anticipatory Design Science, they both have influenced what I'm calling utopian, social, uh, utopian anarchism. But utopian socialism has influenced me using this name here, utopian anarchism. <laughs> so utopian socialism, it was before Marxism was a big thing. It was people like, you know, Charles Fourier and a lot of other old European men that uh, had this idea of like, you, you imagine, yeah, the kind of ideal society you want and you make your arguments for it. And then a lot of them were uh, into the idea of creating utopian colonies. You know, they call them colonies. You can call them, call them intentional communities or whatever. Yeah. Where like not, people... Not, not the best terminology these days. Oh, yeah. The, the word colony, yeah. <laughs> it's a, but a lot of them, yeah, people that were exposed to these ideas and became excited about them, uh, a lot of them then got together and moved to North America in the United States because at the time that was like the new land, the new frontier and, you know, lots of space available. So a lot of different colonies were created of these utopian socialists to like create their new societies. And uh, yeah, they all pretty much failed, but I appreciate the spirit. <laughs> so <laughs> one, thing, one thing about the original utopian socialists though is that they weren't libertarian. They, they were some of them were pretty authoritarian, like Saint Simon, oh, where yeah. they were kind of like you remember the Zeitgeist movement, right? Oh yeah, that was really popular for a period of time. <laughs> yeah, it would kind of be like, well, I guess the people watching this probably have no idea what that is. So, and they they weren't so concerned about the no democracy, even though they were concerned with like technically creating uh, better societies. And yeah, the same thing goes with uh, Buckminster Fuller. He was very similar to like this kind of a, yeah, like a technocrat, like the engineer, technocrat, scientist person that designs the ideal society and everyone needs to fit into the mold and march in lockstep. So that kind of approach I'm not into, <laughs> but I do like the kind of more systemic kind of engineering mindset. But then you also, at the same time, keep in mind how does like group decision-making and interpersonal relationships and conflict management, how, how can you do all those things in a way that's really humanistic and that kind of connects with people? And like I said earlier, it's based on like the authentic heartfelt conversations with people instead right. of trying to get people to fit into a mold. Yeah. Uh, but, but, and that's also why I call my thing utopian anarchism instead of utopian socialism, because, you know, the having like the, the love for freedom and all that kind of stuff, you know, be really at the forefront is important. Yeah. And definitely you don't want to confuse people about that because uh, <laughs> the technocratically planned society is not uh, usually an anarchist ideal at all. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, all right. Nonviolent communication. We've talked about it a bit. You did mention person centered therapy in there though. Well, yes, yeah. because nonviolent communication it kind of came about through like these different, I'd say maybe you could say three different influences for creating it. One of which was Manfred Max Neef's Universal Human Needs. Uh, another is the humanistic psychology, uh, particularly Carl Rogers' approach, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, in short, I'd say Carl Rogers' approach was a, well, he was a psychotherapist. And so he said that like healthy relationships where people learn and grow in positive ways, it comes about through that having three qualities present. One is the authenticity, people being really honest uh, with the other person. Other is empathy, empathically understanding the other person. And the third is like caring, trying to uncon unconditionally care for the other person and value them. And he says, if you have those three things going on, regardless of what you're saying, eventually people will learn and grow. And so nonviolent communication, uh, the creator of that was Marshall Rosenberg, who's also passed away a few years ago. He was a student of Carl Rogers. And so what he did is he said, well, there are different things that we can do to try to implement that and to intentionally create these kind of relationships. You don't just think about authenticity, empathy, and caring and hope it works out. Instead, there's right. like ways you can get there. And then also I'd say like... Uh, a third influence in the creation of nonviolent communication is nonviolence. You know, it's right there in the name. <laughs> and that's like, you know, uh, Mohandas Gandhi, you know, and his philosophy. And he actually wrote many different books and stuff, but I don't know how many are available in English. But he, huh. there's a lot you could say about, you could have a whole separate podcast just about Gandhi. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's funny that when we talk about that, nonviolence is not the first thing that we even mentioned. Um, yeah. 
Uh, so the next section is your 10 principles. And this is, after we go through this, I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the things I thought were missing. Um, or in other words, some things that could be added. Actually, sorry, I wanted to do the next two sections before we do that. Oh, actually, we just did the 10 principles earlier. Oh, then, okay. That's okay. That's repeated. Okay. Yeah. But then there's the 10 practices. Yes. So yeah. it's after this section that I wanted to have that conversation. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about this because they're all really good. Yeah. So these are like practical things that already exist in the world that people can do or experience or learn from, study, all that. And so, uh, and these all kind of inf are things that I have experience with as, and so they kind of influence what I'm calling utopian anarchism. So the first one is egalitarian income sharing intentional communities. And uh, there's an organization in the United States called the Federation of Egalitarian Communities, the FEC. And you can go to their website, uh, thefec.org and find out more about them. And the, uh, the first intentional community I ever lived at was a Twin Oaks community. It's been around since like 1967. It's in central Virginia. And it's kind of like the largest, you know, kind of strongest intentional community that's in the FEC. And they're all, yeah, egalitarian. They all try to not have hierarchies. Uh, try to, and they all have different systems depending on the community of how they practice that. And uh, they're income sharing. You know, they get money through, usually from businesses that they own and run together. And then the money supports the whole community instead of going to individuals. And they're usually, yes, yeah, secular and nonviolent too. Oh, so not based yeah. on religion. Which a lot of the early communes were or are. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'd say like a lot of like these intentional communities that have been strong and survived over time have been based on religion. Like, for yeah. example, the, there's the Hutterites. I'm amazed that the Hutterites even exist. There's like hundreds of these intentional communities across uh, North America, you know, U.S. and Canada. And they've been there for like a very long time. And people don't even think about them. But they, they have a whole kind of parallel society within our society. The, I think that's, um, that's really amazing. And it's – I've never heard of them in particular. But what comes to mind for me is other – like the Amish or the uh, – um, Forget the other. Oh, oh, the Mennonites you're thinking. Yes. Yeah, and they're related. Yeah, they all come from like the Anabaptist tradition. Mm -hmm. And the, the Hutterites, I think there are more intentional communities of the Hutterites, more so than Mennonites and the Amish. But like they they kind of like try to avoid PR stuff. You know, they just have their society <laughs> and they have kids and they have different generations, you know, that are living there. And they are in the United States and Canada, but they just try to just stay away from like mainstream society. Yeah. On the one hand, like, it seems like religion might be, uh, you know, one of the things that holds these together. On the other hand, though, it wasn't until relatively recently in human history that not being religious <laughs> was a thing. So, yeah, of like course, even an option. Yeah. <laughs> of, of, yeah. Yeah. Of course, like medieval communes were religious that they were all religious anyway. Everything was. So that's how and they that, saw the world. And that's so interesting, too, because, like, there's a lot of things I do really love about religion in, in the sense of, like, people having a belief that really inspires and motivates them their whole life. And, like, uh, having a sense of community coming together based on around shared beliefs and values mm -hmm. and really, like, taking it personally and having your life dedicated to it. But at the other hand, there's, like, the kind of, you know, superstition and the kind of group think and all these things that can be associated with it, too. So yeah. I'd love to find ways to like have the positive aspects present without the negative aspects. <laughs> that seems like the ticket. Speaking yeah. of religion, though, number two. Kinda. Uh, number two, yeah, that also comes from a religion. Yeah, the Vipassana meditation practice. And in particular, my experience is with the Vipassana meditation from the SN Goenka tradition. <laughs> and uh, this is a, if you go to the website, dhamma.org, that's like D-H-A-M-M-A dot org. You find all these different Vipassana meditation courses and centers all around the world that are that I find it really amazing. It's all based on a gift economy basis. Like they don't accept, they don't have, they don't charge anything, and all the the money and the labor that they accept is only from people that have successfully completed one of the ten day residential courses that they offer. So let's and go the, into oh yeah 
Yeah, yeah. So, like, so I find it Vipassana, like, interesting from a social perspective and a personal individual perspective. The individual perspective is, like, just based on self-awareness, just uh, being aware of your own thoughts and your feelings and your body and just not judging it, not pushing anything away or clinging to anything, but just what's present? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, how, what's your body doing? What do you feel? Where do you feel it? And how does it change over time? You know, and just trying to be aware in a non-judgmental way. And that, that's the essence of a Vipassana meditation practice. But then you have the, the social thing for these uh, courses where it's all like gift economy and volunteer basis. And I find that like really amazing too, in that they've been able to like run all these centers all around the world for so many years now. Are they the ones that do like the free vegan buffets and stuff? Or oh, you probably oh, no, I'm thinking the Hare Krishnas. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I used yeah. to go to one of those when I was was in uh, Eugene, Oregon. It was really good. Oh yeah, yeah. God, yeah. I I think I went to the same one in Eugene, Oregon too. <laughs> 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 yeah. What that one wasn't free, but it was pretty cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and but uh, no, but they are like vegetarian actually, and uh, the Vipassana meditation people. And actually, my experience in these Vipassana meditation centers, both like sitting in a course as well as volunteering, kind of led to me becoming vegetarian as well, because it, you know, it showed me it's possible to like have a vegetarian life, and you don't have to like sacrifice that much. It's perfectly easy. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that's actually really funny that we wind up talking about that a little bit because. I think um, a lot of the reason I have wound up at the perspective of sort of like presenting alternatives being so important compared with critique and criticism is throughout my life of uh, having conversations with vegetarians or when I've been one myself and talking to other people about it. The number one thing that always uh, uh, had an impact on me was when I was presented with alternatives to meat. So I could watch as many PETA vi videos, you know, as I could learn all about factory farming. I could be horrified by it. But it wasn't until, you know, I actually ate food that I enjoyed that was vegetarian yeah. where, yeah. Oh, the same with me. Yeah. Like uh, my first attempt at trying to be vegetarian was going to uh, the National Conference on Organized Resistance and they had an animal liberation like workshop and they showed all these, you know, vivisecting and factory farm kind of videos. And it horrified me. And I was like, that's it. I'm being vegetarian. And then like a couple hours later, lunchtime came around and I got a chicken sandwich. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then, you know, for pasta meditation, like those courses they offer, they're like basically 12 days, you know? And so after eating a vegetarian diet for 12 days, it's like, Oh, this is doable, sustainable, you know? Yeah. It's, and that's the whole thing, too, is like it's not the arguments that I don't think persuade people as much as like the lived experience, like seeing practical, tangible things you can do. Right. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, I can go into number three then <laughs> uh, as far as practices. And that's an empathic listening exchange. And this uh, comes from like the nonviolent communication community of like. Yeah, empathy groups or empathy buddies or whatever you want to call it, empathy partners of like basically you, you take turns like one one person like talks openly about whatever is on their mind, what's, you know, bothering them or troubling them or they're excited or happy about whatever. They just like share openly and the other person just listens. They don't try to correct or judge or analyze or critique or condemn or whatever. <laughs> just like listen and try to understand from that the person who's speaking from their point of view. What's important to them? How are they feeling? What's really going on? You know, just try to try to understand from the other person's from their shoes, right? <laughs> and the uh, and then you do that for a period of time, ten minutes, an hour, whatever it may be, right? And then you switch, and then the other person, the person that was listening, can then speak, and the other person tries to practice empathy as well. And and that's like a, a it, it can be simple, it can be really difficult, depending on you know your skills or how you're doing emotionally. Like sometimes people like have so many thoughts and feelings going on, like they, they can't really empathize. And so it'd be good maybe to for them to receive empathy first and kind of get whatever's bothering them, you know, off their chest. And then they kind of have more space to really listen to the other. But that's a kind of peer support thing that can happen. 
And in a way, I, that's some of the things that are present too. And like when people go see therapists, is like a lot of times they just want somebody to, in a non judgmental way, just to listen to them. Yes. And you don't, yeah. And so a lot, a lot of that can be accomplished without having to enter like the whole like kind of medical establishment of getting a therapist is like, it's something that people can do for each other as a peer support thing. Yeah, I definitely know I could use some practice at that. I tend to get defensive pretty easily. So yeah. 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 Let's see. Number four here, (laughs) restorative and transformative justice for uh, addressing harm. And yeah, so there's like, in the world of restorative justice and transformative justice, it's uh, all based on like not punishing the bad person, <laughs> uh, but right. instead you, you find out like what harm was caused, who was impacted, uh, how did it affect them, and the, as well as like the person that committed harm, like why did they do it, and then just try to like create as much like healing and restoration of the people and the relationships as possible. So from what I understand, when the word restorative is used, what's being referred to that's being restored is the social relations, right? It's a more um, like communal idea of justice. Am I, do I have that right? Yeah, like to restore the relationships or to restore the community because really bad conflicts can tear apart a community. But then uh, like kind of more radical activist people tend to more advocate transformative justice saying that you don't want to restore things because the way things were were like fundamentally systematically fucked up <laughs> because like uh, we live in this world with all this like you know patriarchy white supremacy capitalism all this stuff and so like instead we want to transform the relationships and so that's kind of a bit more ambitious but it kind of gets mm-hmm. at the same goals of like you're not just punishing the bad guy whoever that is but you're trying to change things and address people and yeah, to, going back to like the four perspectives, right? In a way, you could say that the restorative justice talks more about like the individual and relationship perspective, and transformative justice focuses more on the systemic or structural perspective. Interesting. Yeah, I don't. I haven't looked into that. I'll probably read those later. Yeah. Let's see. Number okay. Five. What, number five: convergent facilitation for group decision making, and so this goes. Uh, this comes from the mind of uh, one of my favorite thinkers who I would call an anarchist, but she does not call herself an anarchist, <laughs> uh, Miki Kashtan. And uh, so I, I would I describe Miki Kashtan's approach, just to put a label on her because I love labels so much, <laughs> uh, a Gandhian anarcha-feminist, I'd call her perspective. And she's a nonviolent communication trainer, but then she's created things such as convergent facilitation. And so with that, it's like, it's a way of facilitating a group where like if people can have like radically different ideas of what they want and such, and maybe even be in conflict with each other. And one of the things you do in these meetings, or first you got to have a meeting, you got to have people together in the same room talking to each other, and which can be difficult in itself. But once you have that, you can have then people talk about their concerns or the things that, you know, is really important to them that they don't want to be overlooked. And then, like, you write on the, a board, you know, bulletin board or, or whatever uh, chalkboard and it's in front of people, the whole group, that concern. Okay, this is an important thing. And then somebody says, no, 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 what about this? Or, like, you're wrong because of this. And then you're like, okay, that's another concern. You write that down on the board. And somebody's like, no, you're forgetting about this, blah, blah, blah. You know? <laughs> and so, like, so basically you're saying, okay, these are the concerns that are important to all of us as a group. And we don't want any of these things to be overlooked or forgotten about or ne- neglected. And so then eventually, after you get everybody's concerns or values, you have it all written down and explicitly stated clearly for everyone to see. Then you're like, okay, then you craft like strategies of things and agreements that you can make together as a group that can address all these different concerns. And so mm-hmm. it's no longer like so many conflicts are like, some people are like really focusing on one concern and someone another, and they're really afraid that their concern or their issue is not going to be attended to. And so with this, it's like, we want all of it to be attended to. And so, yeah, that's... You know, it's funny. I'm looking at the website right now, and they have an app. Oh, wow. Well. So, yeah, you might want to check out the app. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so 21st century, yeah. Yeah. Uh. Cool. Um, number six. 
Oh yeah, the decentralized organizational structures. And I do remember us talking about this before as well. Yeah, <laughs> like it coming from the whole world of like organizational development. Uh, there's like, there's there are different models out there that again, people that don't call themselves anarchists, you know, writing books and putting lots of thought and then like how you can have organizations and structures that are non-hierarchical and decentralized. Yeah. yeah, and so I would say some of the best like thinking and writing on anarchist organizational models and methods have been done by people like you know, not anarchists <laughs> or that don't use the word anarchist and some of which even like come from the corporate world, you know, the corporate facilitators and, you know, consultants and such. Yeah, it turns out other people need to effectively do things in groups too. <laughs> it's not just an anarchist thing. Yeah, and, and you know, effectively do things without hierarchy. And, you know, sometimes right. it's more effective like to do things without hierarchy. Well, that's one of the big things is corporations for a while have understood that uh, strict hierarchical organizational methods lead to all sorts of problems, like whether it's, um, you know, chasing your own tail or going after like the wrong problems because you're not getting feedback yeah. from the ground or uh, oh, yeah. just high turnover, all sorts of stuff is, uh, you know, once I, it almost feels like once the uh, ideologies of socialism were not popular anymore. It was safe for corporations to start using some of these without anybody thinking that, oh, that's socialistic. Oh, yeah. And especially like if you're like wearing a suit and tie and you get corporate funding, you can't be called oh, yeah. a socialist. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah. And just like so, like with hierarchical, you know, workplace structures, right? So many, I've seen it so many times in like in my workplace where like staff don't want to speak up you know they ha might have good ideas they might have concerns or whatever they don't want it, it to be known for the, bo the boss to hear about it because afraid of getting punished or afraid of being forced to do something that they don't want to do and so there's so many like insights and you know potentially valuable things that are not being you know brought to the table so to speak because of like fear of the boss yep yeah uh want to move on to seven yeah, so this going back to our good buddy, uh, Manfred Max Neef. <laughs> and so, like, one of the things that he was involved in, uh, you know, back when he was alive in, in Chile, was uh, human-scale development. And that was, like, going to, like, different, like, villages and stuff. Like, and, yeah, doing needs assessments. Like, what are the needs of everybody here in these local communities? Like, and going into, like, you know, again, like I said, with fundamental human needs, it can be uh, physical, but then also social and community-wide. And, like, how are these needs being met and how are they not being met? And just like kind of mapping out for the whole community, like what are the needs and how are they, what are the satisfiers, you know, that are being used or how effective are the satisfiers for meeting these needs? And uh, what other strategies can we pursue if they're not working or not working as fully as, as they could? And I believe uh, in my blog, I do link to, let's see i'll click on it a human scale I, development uh yeah that's like a copy of his book <laughs> is there a link to from my blog for human scale I, development i actually have pulled up the universal human needs partial list on the screen right now oh, okay oh good <laughs> yeah so and so, so that's interesting too because like that was kind of like community development work that uh, man from max neef did based on human fundamental human needs. And then Marsha Rosenberg took like the same, co same concept of fundamental human needs. And he focused more on like interpersonal relationships and people's personal problems. Mm -hmm. But I find it interesting. You combine the two things and you, you can use that concept of fundamental human needs on all these different levels, you know, personally, interpersonally and social structures. There's a part of me that has such a like negative gut reaction to, um, to anyone listing what my needs might be. Just like <laughs> like that's taking away from my individuality or my uniqueness, but yeah, I've definitely learned to push past that. Uh, I used to even I used to really dislike Eric Erickson uh, or Abraham Maslow just because just that feeling that uh, you're, something's being taken away from you when it's universalized. Yeah, yeah, and. 
And that's like, yeah, because it's almost, it could be viewed as like trying to define you or limit or circumscribe you and your whole existence. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I've definitely got over that and found these things very useful. Well, and also I'd recommend too, like uh, kind of going back to the realm of heartfelt conversations, right? Like that can be an area to like explore, like, you know, what's really important to you and in your own words, you know, what uniquely comes up to you as meaningful and stuff. And so there's a whole kind of like exploration that can be done like through empathy and such going into like the touchy feely realm, which I think is important, but not the entirety of my perspective. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a big part. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, spaceship earth. Oh yeah. So this is going back to Buckminster Fuller, another, another wonderful dead guy. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, he wrote a book, which uh, I have here somewhere, <laughs> uh, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. And that's like kind of looking at like from the whole comprehensive anticipatory design science, how can you, in that kind of, from that perspective, design humanity and planet Earth <laughs> in a way that meets at the most needs possible for the most people possible with a least amount of effort, you know, in the quickest amount of time frame. <laughs> yeah. So like, and, and so basically kind of engineering wise, you know, based on all the resources and materials that we have available on planet earth, you know, how can we organize and design things? Yeah, I, I should read that. That should definitely be on my list. Yeah. And I linked to a, a project you know, on the uh, Book Mr. Fuller Institute, which I believe is now based in San Francisco, but they have a website, bfi.org, I believe. Uh, and they have the cooperating manual for Spaceship Earth. And there's all kinds of like, uh, if you go there, yeah, different practices and the things that people are doing that are trying to implement this perspective. So you can go there and look for a, like a catalog from that. Yeah, I'm checking it out right now. Interesting. Cooperative's convergence. Okay. Um, okay. So oh, the there's, next a, there's one. a lot there. Yeah. The next one is a uh, group size limited by Dunbar's number. And uh, I think I remember uh, listening to like years ago, a podcast that you were on. I think it went when you lived in the Bay area. Yeah. I yep. remember you talked about Dunbar's number. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and basically the idea behind that is like this uh, anthropologist Dunbar, I think he's still alive, uh, had this idea that like there's a maximum number of relationships that people can have and still feel like a sense of connection with each person in the relationship. Right. Uh, And that if you go beyond that, that number is like usually, I guess, around like 150 or 200, something like that. Yep. Yeah, and if you go beyond that number of relationships, then the relationships become abstract and impersonal and all that and that so with that in mind i you know and based on you know heartfelt connection being so important for all this to work i think that whatever communities you create should be limited by that number and to bring it back to the hutterites because i you can't forget the hutterites you know, <laughs> they what? keep that principle in mind with their communes and, or colonies whatever they call it and they have a whole system in place that they've been doing for decades of like once the community reaches a certain number they split. It's like a yeah. cell division kind of thing. You know what else does that is the buy nothing, uh, buy nothing groups. Oh. Um, I'll get into that some other time. I'm actually yeah. I'm gonna have someone on to talk about that. So, oh okay. But they split after getting to a certain size uh, because for all the reasons that we're interested in Dunbar's number. Yeah. And so let's see, the last that I have here of these 10 practices listed is uh, student-centered learning. And this goes uh, back to like Carl Rogers, you know, the humanistic psychologist. And uh, his whole thing was like that learning best happens when like the learner, or you can call them the student, <laughs> like uh, when it's like based on their interest and their curiosity is kind of what drives it forward. So it's kind of, it's centered around the student. And so you don't focus on curriculum and agendas as much, but more like, what is it that you're interested in? What do you want to learn? And so I remember Carl Rogers, he wrote like, uh, cause he would teach as well as doing therapy. And so he would teach in that way. And he would like begin the class saying, hi, I'm Carl Rogers. I'm a famous guy. I've written a bunch of stuff. I know a bunch of stuff, but you know, whatever that's, that is what it is. What do you guys want to know? And usually, like, the students, it was usually chaos after that because people are so used to, like, 
you know, you have an agenda in the curriculum and they just like shove the knowledge down your throat. And so a lot of times people are like, I don't know what I need to know. You tell me what to do. And, and then he'd be like, oh, you sound really frustrated. So, uh, yeah. Do you want to go into that? <laughs> but eventually, like eventually people get clear within themselves about what's important to them. What is their curiosity and where are the interests? What does it really lie and stuff? And, and then based on that, they can ask questions and create their each individual directions that they want to go as far as pursuing their interests. And there's schools entirely based on that now. There's the famous one, A.S. Neal's Summerhill. Oh, yeah. But then there's also a series of school called Sudbury Valley. Yeah, oh, I was going to mention Sud them. Valley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it works. I mean, this is not some half-baked idea uh, of how things should be. I mean, it, this really is something that works. Yeah. I mean, number, another anarchist, uh, I don't know if you've ever talked about him before, Paul Goodman. Oh, I uh, love Paul Goodman. Oh, yeah, he was a great guy. <laughs> so, like, I mean, he had this idea for schools that it should not be bigger than, like, a house, you know, and <laughs> that you have, like, two so-called teachers and, you know, maybe, like, ten kids. And uh, it's all, like, based on this kind of model, you know, like, have it be really small, like, kind of intimate personal relationships and everybody pursues their interests and the teacher helps facilitate you know, a semi-controlled chaos kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think in an interview, he actually said that he doesn't even think schools are necessary. It was, uh, he was on firing line with, what's his face? Um, oh, like William F. Buckley? Was that yes. Right? Yeah, okay, I remember that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. It's worth checking out. Oh, I think I saw the video too. Like, I think he mentioned like uh, how like pornography could be a useful yeah. tool <laughs> and that the problem with schools is that there's not enough pornography in schools. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah. It's, it's really funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, one thing you wrote about, I didn't realize Ruth Kinna uh, would refer to herself as a utopian oh. anarchist. Oh yeah. I got the, the book right here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. Utopianism. Yeah. Yeah, I've been uh, winding up reading her stuff a lot lately, just thinking about Prudhomme. And uh, she's on the Anarchist uh, Studies Network stuff a lot, or one of those. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, all this, like, uh, British anarchist stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, her and Alex Pritchard, or yeah. Pritchard, or I don't know how it's pronounced. Yeah, there's like a whole tradition of like these like British anarchists that I just really love. Like Colin Ward was one. Yeah, too. me too. I, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Herbert uh, Reed. Yeah, yeah there's, they're some of my absolute favorites. Yeah. You know, Herbert Reed uh, was a surrealist. I didn't realize that oh, yeah. they actually, he actually had a really big role in the surrealist movement in Britain. Oh, wow. Yeah, I knew that he was like primarily known for his like literary work. More so than yeah, him. but uh, yeah, he was one of the the main people that brought surrealism to Britain. I just learned all this reading about the British Situationist International, and uh, one of the books I was reading begins talking about the British Surrealist movement. But anyway, not to go off topic. Uh, so there's a couple things that I felt like could be added to. Um, to what you're doing here, which uh, I don't think there's anything that should be taken away. But for me, what I would want to see after reading this is like more technical practices. And specifically, I'd like to see like, how long would it take to learn what type of practice, how much labor is required, how much does it cost to do it, to really get down to like, you know, you could really see what your investment would need to be to start changing things like immediately. Wow. God, yeah, you just like kind of touched on like another blog idea that I've had in my mind, but I haven't written. So that probably means I need to write it before we talk again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, but like a you know, program. like how, how long would it take to learn basic plumbing or something? Yeah. Like yeah. things like that. What tools would you need? And then... I think, yeah, if you could, if we could start thinking about that, things like that more, I think it would go so far, like just for each of your 10 points, your 10 practices, be able to, oh. to start doing some of that. Oh, so I, yeah. So I thought about it in terms of like the four perspectives 
And uh, like what I have in mind is like already existing programs, like learning programs that people other than me have already created that one could sign up for and do in like four in a row. <laughs> uh, and then after you've done that, then you have like a, a basic training foundation in my kind of utopian anarchism. So like yeah. what I came up with is like, so for the individual personal perspective, like to do one of those free 10 day Vipassana meditation courses. And, you know, after the 10 days that then you've, you've gotten the basics of Vipassana meditation down. Uh, and then for the interpersonal, uh, I recommend doing what they call an, interna an international intensive training that the Center for Nonviolent Communication organizes. It's a nonviolent communication residential course, also about 10 days or so, and they have them around the world. Uh, and then for the structural perspective, uh, an event that just ended recently uh, at the Twin Oaks, they have an annual intentional communities conference at Twin Oaks in Virginia uh, that happened around Labor Day weekend. But I think there are other intentional community organizations that have their conferences and stuff to like learn the basics of intentional communities and intentional community design. Yeah. And then for, oh, <laughs> oh, and then the fourth perspective, uh, the physical, uh, would be uh, taking a permaculture design course. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And like, I wonder what, you know, I'm always wondering what some of the learning curves are like on these things. And of course, there, you know, there's going to be regional differences, especially with permaculture. So like, how long... How much effort does it take to really become familiar with common flora and fauna, you know, in the region you live? And how do you go from that to creating useful tools and and things that are going to be needed, uh, you know, to have a, a self-sustaining society or maybe yeah. not even society, just a group? Yeah, that would be really interesting to see. And I think. I think when I talk to people about anarchism and they start asking me questions about, you know, what would an anarchist society look like or things like that? This is the kind of stuff I wish I had handy just to be like, not even, I mean, all the organizational stuff's really important, the communication, everything like that. Uh, what I think people have learned to be a ver have an aversion to though, uh, not though also is doing physical things, making things on um, permaculture. Oh, getting uh, your hands dirty. <laughs> yeah. Repair. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, there's gendered issues when it comes to that. There's just so many ways people have been told that they're not the right person to, to build their own home or to fix their own electronic stuff or whatever. And, yeah. I think it's oppressive. I think it's one of the major uh, ways that our our culture disempowers people. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like we have like like such an like an alienated, disempowered, consumerist society, <laughs> and so <laughs> it just kind of like outsource everything from like you know who knows where you know, and it just kind of shows up, and you just consume it, and then yeah, people have like the very specialized division of labor, so they do their little thing, their little job whatever and right then that's and like it, the only productive activity they do yeah and then we imagine the whole thing you know we imagine like like maker spaces for example and like different like learning structures they can create where people can like learn and explore these things together and it also that also the consumer culture also teaches people and encourages them to become whiners and complainers about everything yeah. and um because that, you know, it takes your power away from you to be able to do the thing yourself. And so you're you're left with just being able to complain, just being able to protest, just being able to, you know, write your congressperson or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in a way, like that kind of segues into the whole thing of like so much of anarchism and radical politics being like denouncing X, Y and Z instead of like pursuing the thing that you want to pursue. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think that really ties those two things tie together a lot. Um, yeah. I, I, the more I, I, uh, see behaviors I don't like that are like that. I realize that they're a product of our consumer culture. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think we covered a hell of a lot here and I, because of your blog, I have a ton of links to put in the show description and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Was there any, what, what else would you want to talk about? Oh, the five processes that I got from the nonviolent global liberation <laughs> community. Yeah. That, Is there uh, something I could pull up for that? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, the other blog entry, Imagining Utopian Anarchist Communities. Okay. I, I give like another list. Oh, there's no numbers on them, but the number is five. <laughs> and that's a, basically for any group or you know social structure that you create, uh, the idea is like there's five things you need to keep in mind when you're designing this group structure. And those five things are uh, decision-making, resource flow, information flow, feedback loops, and conflict engagement. Okay. And so... Yeah, it's kind of, this is uh, from the Nonviolent Global Liberation website. Uh, NGLcommunity.org is the website for that. Like, uh, they give questions for each one of these things, like decision-making. Who makes what decisions? Through what process? Who gives input? Who hears about the decisions? For resource flow, the questions would be, what resources exist? How are they generated? How are they distributed? What principles are used to decide the flow? Who makes the decisions? Information flow would be what information is shared and with whom, what mechanisms are used for sharing. Them. And for feedback, uh, who gives feedback to whom, for what purpose and how, how often, what external feedback mechanisms would support learning about the effectiveness. Uh, conflict engagement, because conflicts inevitably come about <laughs> among people, you know. So with that in mind is like what support is available for conflicts what process is used for engaging with the conflict? How can anyone initiate it? And how is that all made known to people? All right. Yeah, those are really good questions to be asking. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think one thing, you know, I want to make sure we say before this is over is that, you know, for all this detail you're providing and all of these ideas, how important it is that you're not uh, telling people what to do necessarily. Yeah. It's not about like there's many ideas that I can tell, <laughs> but I think the key thing is dialogue, you know, people to like have dialogue and to ask questions, ask questions of themselves and each other. Yeah. Um, one random thing that just popped into mind. What do you think of Pericon, Michael oh. Albert and all that? Cause he just put out a new book mm -hmm. actually, uh, I'm waiting for it to come. Wow. Yeah, I didn't even know he was still alive, actually. <laughs> yeah, he's been doing, like, interviews, uh, and he has a podcast now um, called something Z something. Uh, I'm going to yeah, look it up I, right now. Yeah, because I think he was in, like, Z Media for Z Magazine and stuff. He was one of the key people. And I used to read Z Magazine back in the 90s, so I've kind of lost touch with all that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, got the wrong website pulled up here. Um, but my, with my memory, of course, uh, of with Pericon and Michael Albert's work is like, that it was like highly structured way of having inequal communism, basically. And it's a, uh, it kind of reminded me of like Maury Bookchin's libertarian municipalism. And right. Like, yeah. Lots of meetings, <laughs> tons of meetings. And in a way, like, it's interesting, like, I remember Bob Black having a critique of Maury Bookchin saying that that kind of approach is like ruled by those who can stand the most meetings, you know, <laughs> those who have the most like tolerance to be able to put in the most hours. Those are the ones that make the decisions. Right? And the, this, that's why in my mind, you kind of need to restructure meetings that be more humanistic, right? Like how, how is each individual doing? What are their capacity and abilities? You know, how can they contribute all these different ways? And to keep in mind that meetings, you know, sometimes they go in all kinds of different ways and sometimes they can just like beat the hell out of people, you know, like, just take the energy right out of people. And so like, I think it's so crucial to like find ways to have meetings that like, like honor where people are at, you know, and that don't drain the energy or if they're draining energy too much to change things and just be creative about it so that you can get the most that you can out of everybody and not yeah. Brutalize people. <laughs> That's like the toughest sell because it's so everyone hates meetings and it's so easy for an authoritarian or an apologist for that. And here I'm thinking of Thaddeus Russell specifically yeah. to uh, just emphasize the shit out of 
how terrible meetings can be and who wants to live in a society where you're going to meetings or a job where you have to have more meetings. It's like, but, but still like, I mean, the key thing is like communication, you know, people all communicating with each other and uh, information flow too, or actually even all those things that I mentioned, like, like you can address ways to have decision-making resource flow, information flow, feedback and conflict engagement. Like that you can just, you know, be creative and think of different ways that you can address all these needs. And so it could be meetings or not. Right. The key thing is like that you are sharing information and that you are making decisions together. Yeah, exactly. Like not all decisions need to be made like in a room uh, with um, everyone present waiting to come to consensus. You could have an email chain. You could do all sorts of other things. Yeah, to, for to make a decision and deadlines can be changed and all you know. Uh, oh, and and one key thing too, I want to mention in those like five processes, the feedback loops, right? Giving feedback, I think that's one that's often overlooked, and and then it expresses itself on in negative ways because it's overlooked. Because like for example, I'm thinking like like job performance reviews. Like a lot of times because of hierarchy, a lot of times the boss. When I've ever had, you know, performance reviews, I always think to myself, you don't know me. You don't know the work I do, <laughs> you know? And so, like, a lot of the times, like, the best feedback would be from, like, your coworkers who actually see you at work and, like, know how you're doing at work. Uh, like, to get feedback from them. But, like, the, a lot of times workplaces, there's no mechanism for giving feedback aside from, like, you know, kind of shit talking <laughs> or coming at people and, like, you're bad and you're fucked up in all these different ways. And so, like, and then usually, of course, when people are presented with that kind of statements, usually people shut down and they can't really take in the feedback. They're just defensive instead. And but still, there's valuable information that can be learned about how we all affect each other. And so, we need ways to like to express it. Like, you know, you're affecting me X, Y, and Z. And uh, it's not that you're bad, but you just might not be aware of these things. And there are ways we can probably do things differently. Yeah, my job actually started doing something called 360 degree feedback or whatever so now i gotta i had to make a list of like 10 people that i've worked with to give feedback on them and i'm on other people's lists and it's just like that's better but i mean the other part of my job is that i'm working so much i don't have time for that yeah yeah and that's like keeping in mind yeah the lives of the whole person, right? Like, yeah. are people getting sufficient rest and socialization and, you know, regeneration kind of thing? Yeah. yeah. And then also, like, because of hierarchy and, like, this culture of, you know, domination and punishment, like, if you give feedback in that kind of way that you talked about, it could very easily be either be perceived as or actually be a way of snitching on someone. Yeah, it's a threat. <laughs> Yeah, or throwing right. someone under the bus, you know, and that's like, that's not helping things at all. That's like destroying relationships. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Well, cool. By the way, that Michael Albert podcast is called Revolutions with a Z at the end instead of an S. Wow, he just loves the letter Z, it seems. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you a link to that. Um, you've heard him talk before, right? Uh, no, actually, I've only like read his stuff. I haven't heard him talk. Okay. Oh, yeah. You'll have the opportunity. Oh, does he have like a really unique voice or something? <laughs> no, he's just pretty pretty dry. Uh, oh, God. That's how he yeah. works. <laughs> he has like canned things that he likes to say every time. and But the podcast is good because it gets him out of that saying the same shit all the time thing. And that's kind of like, you know, going back to like Marshall Rosenberg who created Nonviolent Communication and then his teacher, Carl Rogers. Like they, that's... An interesting perspective of like how they presented themselves where like Marshall Rosenberg had like a canned thing. He had like a rant that you would hear all the time. But then Carl Rogers, he said in one of his writings that he doesn't like to repeat himself more than two times because mm. if he, he found that if he repeats himself more than then two or three times, he loses his sense of authenticity that he's not being a real person authentically in the moment. That's and, how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. I notice a lot of people come to the, they have, well, just you're you're in danger of doing that with your H's, <laughs> your quadruple H's. Not oh. that you have done it, but that would be something that, like, you know, uh, someone who does a lot of public speaking might get in the habit of saying all the time. 
Yeah. Or, or like anything that I've presented here with, with like these like numbered lists and stuff, right? Like that could become like a cliche thing and I could repeat it all the time. But like, and so that's a key thing of like, uh, was it not to make sure that the map's not the territory that, <laughs> uh, like, so that all, all of what I'm presenting with utopian anarchism, it's kind of like guidelines or a framework, but like the core thing I think is relationships with people and stuff and how you're living your life and how you're making choices and such. And that all the changes, you know, moment to moment and situation and context and you know, all these different things, it's, it's all variable. Yeah. So when do we get to talking about the barricades, Ian? Ah, it's interesting too, because like, like for example, like one anarchist uh, that I like a lot is, you know, Gustav Landauer. And like, oh, you yeah. know, he had the same perspective too, of like the state being a social relationship and you don't destroy it and smash it and stuff. It's about changing your relationships. And that's totally like, you know, my perspective too. And, but then I think it was like 1919 or 1918 when there was that revolution in Germany and there were like Bulgaria. barricades and fighting in the streets. Like he totally dived right into it. <laughs> yeah, like, he was, um, he was, he actually wound up, I think, sitting on the council for the Bavarian revolutionary, whatever. Yeah. And I think they ended up killing Bavarian him. Socialist yeah. Republic. Yes, he was definitely murdered by yeah. by reactionaries. Yeah, and so that's it's yeah, it's kind of hard to like resist yeah, the lure. Or I don't know, I think it like it's up to each individual to decide like how they want to like participate in like protests and barricades and such like that. Because like yeah, yeah I don't want to like kind of shit on anybody that chooses a more activism or conflictual kind of like way of approaching anarchism. Um, it's just like, for me, that's not the perspective I'm taking or the approach or emphasis that I want to have. Yep. Yeah. Understandable. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, cool. I think we got a lot of good stuff here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. And uh, I plan on like continuing to like think and write and develop this kind of anarchism because in a way, like I've said in my blogs, you know, I've, been thinking about this and building up these kind of perspectives like the whole my whole anarchist career so to speak you know since the 90s and uh now it's kind of more refined to kind of encompass all these like different perspectives of you know the physical personal interpersonal etc and uh but it's still kind of a work in progress and a key thing is like is uh what i said in my most recent blog about creating these communities and yeah with, with that like i do uh I, I do have some kind of hope and excitement around that nonviolent global liberation, that mm. group, you know, there are people in it that are wanting to create intentional communities around the world that are practicing these kind of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a lot of work. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> Decades. Yeah. yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, well, let everyone know again, what your blog URL is and, uh, yeah, then we'll we'll say goodbye. Yeah, yeah. So my blog is a parenthesis i, uh, yeah, p a r e n t h e s i s e y e dot blogspot dot com. Awesome. So, yeah. All right. Well, until next time, uh, which I'm sure we will be talking again. Um, audience, toodaloo. <laughs> yeah. See ya.